All right, well, hey, we're in our Better Story series. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Noah. Before we do that, though, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple thoughts. Um, number one is this. My heart for our church is that we would have a love for this book that we would have the right view of this book. Because I think so many people, unconsciously, they have a view of this book that might have been developed throughout their childhood or in church when they were young or what they've heard online where they view this book not as a blessing but as a burden. They view it as, a, as an encyclopedia or you view it as, as a book that just has information about God or you view it as a, as a book of just like laws. Or, you know, and, and yes, there is part of the book that tells us what is right and what is wrong. There is information, is this, there, there is history in it, but ultimately the Bible is about revelation. Everyone say revelation. The Bible is about revelation. It's not just information. Revelation is where God reveals who he is and what he is like. To us, But one of the things that I love about the Bible as well the, is that you realize that as you read the Bible, the Bible didn't just happen, the Bible happens. Right? You realize that as you're reading this book, you actually realize that you just, it's not just this story, but you find your story in this story. And that's why you can see of, of we think we're so advanced in our world and we've just advanced so much throughout the years. But what you realize is not a lot has changed. Just, tech, just technology, right? Humanity hasn't. That when you look in Scripture, you can actually see there, there's a lot more going on um, that is happening right now. And so my, my heart, so, so what I actually wanted to do was actually read a portion of Scripture from the book of Psalms where we see David talking about God's word that I just wanted to share real quick before we dive into the meat and, the meat and potatoes. How many know it's Father's Day? Meat and potatoes, baby. Come on. I don't know about you, man. Steak and potatoes. A big ribeye. Come on, Jesus. Um, but just before we dive into the meat and potatoes of today's message, I just want to share with you what, I, I don't know, just like what I feel like my heart is the way that you would see God's words being in your life. This is Psalm 19, 7 through 11. This is what David writes. He says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing what? Joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Anyone need insight? Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, and there's a great reward for those who obey them. Do you all hear the the terminology here? Like his, like his word revives our soul. His word brings wisdom where there is folly. The word of God helps us to have insight for living. It's fair. It makes us wise. It, is, it says it's more valuable than gold, sweeter than honey. My heart is that as we come, you know, not corporately as a church, but even each person individually in their times with the Lord, when we come to the word that we know that we're coming to a treasure chest that's full of so many riches and wisdom and truth to revive our soul, to bring joy to our hearts. And so my prayer is that when we dive into this book, individually and corporately, that there would be this expectation of, I'm going to have joy. It's going to revive my heart. It's going to make me wise. It's going to give me insight. It's going to be good for my, for my soul. Amen. So we've been in a series called Better Stories, looking at People in the Bible who lived and modeled the better way, which is our theme for 2024. And today we're going to look at Noah. Everyone say Noah. Noah. Noah's kind of the crazy boat builder, right? It's kind of how we know Noah. He's the dude that was crazy enough to build a boat when it hadn't rained yet. And so Noah kind of can get this, you know, this crazy guy with a, the with a beard, crazy enough to take his family on this adventure of building a boat. And there's no doubt that he is the boat builder, but you also have to understand Noah is in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis at, at the beginning, but you also find he's also mentioned in the Bible multiple times, most notably by Jesus Christ. Okay? So here, here's the thing, right? When you look at the Old Testament of Scripture, you have to make sure you view it from the lens, not of what culture does, but of the way Jesus did it. Some of the things we look in the Old Testament, Noah and Jonah, Abraham, like, all of these characters in the Old Testament, David, we can look at them and be like, well, that was just history. When, 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 when you actually look at it, Jesus mentioned them by name and actually used them for teaching points in his ministry, which is what we actually see from 
Noah. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking about the end times. So Jesus is saying, let me tell you what it will be like in the end times before I come back. Let's go ahead and jump in here. Matthew 24, verse 36 through 39. It says, but about that day, and he's talking about the day that he'll come back for the second coming. No one knows the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Can I just pause right there and be like, why are we trying to guess when Jesus comes back? Right? How many books have been sold, like, you know, trying to scare people up from the tribulation? Right? And we can have this, like, I, you know, I remember seeing books, like, in 1988, a guy wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Is Coming Back in 1988. Oops, saith God. Then in, when he didn't come back in 1988, he wrote a book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus Is Coming Back in 1989. He stopped writing them after that one. But it's crazy how we can spend so much energy trying to figure out when he's gonna come back. When Jesus said, only, only my father knows, we don't spend time preparing ourselves for when he comes back. And this is why it's so important. We focus on what we can control and let what's God's like, prerogative, let him deal with it, right? It's so comforting to let God do what he's paid to do, be in control and in charge. And you do what you're called to do, which, which is to live as he's called us to live and in obedience. But then you see it this, it's, it says this, as it was in the days of who? Noah. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what Jesus is referring to, he is saying that in the last days, it will be similar to the days of Noah, which we're going to look at what those days of Noah were. But we see Noah here, not just as, as a person, but even this, the age that he grew up in and the age of what he did, what he did. Jesus is saying there are some similarities between then and similarities between the age we're living in now. In Hebrews 11, 7, we see Noah brought up as being in the hall of faith, as being someone that is a model for us to follow. This is what it says, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, and that was called rain, right? Like he had been building a boat when he had never seen rain. It says, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So we see that, yes, Noah was the boat builder guy. He built the ark and saved, and saved his family, but also the times Noah lived in teaches us, but also Noah's example teaches us. And some of the times that were surrounding Noah in the book of Genesis, you can actually see, let me give you a quick synopsis of Genesis leading up to the time that Noah uh, we see Noah's account um, done in, in, in Genesis 6. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that God created the world, and he set in place order and set in place divine, um, divine order in how things are called to be, right? So you see him creating the world, making man and woman in his own image. You've got these binaries. You have got the sun, the moon, darkness, and light, the earth, and sea, so you've, you've got, because here's the thing, right? God is a God of order, okay? God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. So we see God creating in Genesis. So in the first two, two chapters, we see God creating, making and bringing, and bringing order and bringing beauty. And we actually see the character of God whenever, it, whenever God creates something, he says, it was what? Good. Can't you just see God making something? Be like, yo, that's good. Yeah. That's what men do, right? We, well, I don't make anything. I'm like the worst of builder of anything, but, you know, like, it's, it's, it's good. But then we see in Genesis 3 that that's when sin came in. Adam and Eve, they were both tempted, and they, and they gave in, and that's where we see brokenness and sin and the curse and kind of where, where things start off the trajectory of where we're at now, the burden of sin. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain, Abel, we see their story. What happens when there is brokenness and sin is there becomes brokenness in families. In Genesis chapter 5, then we see you know, that's when the whole like be fruitful and multiply things happen. You see this lineage of people that just had kids and kids and kids and kids. And then we get to Genesis chapter 6 where there was like the account of Noah and things had gotten so bad on the earth that God was like, this is crazy. I'm going to have to start over. These people have gotten so buck wild and crazy and there's so much wickedness and so much craziness going on because they've gotten out of divine order. I don't, I, you know, even what scripture says is my spirit cannot contend with man forever. And he says, I'm gonna have to bring some judgment 
And so he calls Noah in Genesis 6. But before we dive into, like I said, the meat and potatoes of kind of Noah's story, I want to dive into a couple things. Since it's Father's Day, can we just give it up for all the dads one, one more time? And really today, I'm going to lean towards the men with this message. So ladies, you, you go and get something too, okay? But I really today want to specifically speak to the men in this place. Um, and what I pray, what I hope you hear, men, is not condemnation, shame, and guilt and putting you down. What I hope you hear is that God has his hand saying, come up to something better. Because even what I think happens many times with men in church, I think inherently men struggle. Like, I think inherently men, we have this proclivity to look at what we're not and what we lack instead of who God says we are. I just think it's inerrant. Like, it's, it's, it's something that we just struggle with. So, Many times what happens is men, they come into church and all they hear and, you know, is kind of like, you're horrible, you're terrible, you need to follow Jesus, <laughs> right? But what I see in scripture is that like where man actually starts is it says that they're made in the image of God, right? Yes, it has been skewed through sin, there is no doubt, but I believe that what the heart of where God wants to call men from isn't to start with shame and guilt and condemnation. It wants to start with, this is who you were. I, I originally created and made you to be, my image, right? And that's what, what we can actually see. So let's look at Genesis chapter two really quick. And I wanna show you kind of what we see from creation order, God's idea and heart for men. There's a lot different way God forms a man and how culture forms a man, Okay? The way God forms a man is a lot different than the way culture, and we're gonna actually see this. So what we actually see first in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, is that we are created and made and formed in God's image. Men, let me just remind you, like I said, and encourage you with that. You are made in the image of God. So you have dignity and value and worth and, sig and significance. And this is before you've done, you've done or will do a thing. Why is this such good news? Because in our culture, our culture says, men, you have to accomplish, then you have an identity. Accomplish something good enough, and then you can be worthy enough. And let me tell you, that is not the way God starts. God says, because you are stamped with my image, you have worth and value. And from that, you then strive to be what I've called you to be. But let me tell you what, what, what happens many times. Men is... You will be told in our culture to seek your identity and build your, build your own life and build your own identity, or you'll be told, look inside of this good little self you have, and you'll find yourself, and then from finding yourself, you'll make yourself. And can, can I just say this is a huge reason why I think we have so much worry, anxiety, and depression in our culture? Is we are trying to build and make something we were inherently created to receive? How many people feel the burden of having to create their lives? Make their identity. Make them valuable. Do you know how much of a weight that is? When that is a weight and burden, you were never meant to carry. Why? Because as humans, especially men, women, like we were called to receive our identity from God. So what I say is instead of looking out to find an identity, instead of looking inside to create, we don't, we don't look out, we don't look in. What do we do? We look up. And we receive it from him. See, we're created and formed in God's image. And this is such good news. Secondly, though, we see in the created order, after he created and formed him, what did God do? He gave the man a J-O-B. He gave him a job. He, he said, hey, I made this garden, and I want to put you in the garden to work it. And really what God, he just wasn't giving him a job. He was giving him partnership. So we actually see work is not a curse because this was before sin. Work is actually a blessing. Work is actually something that God is for. So some of y'all are like, man, I'm, I'm gonna get to heaven, I'm gonna get in my mansion, and I'm gonna be chilling. God might give you a job. <laughs> Why? Because work is not cursed. Work doesn't have to be cursed. Work is actually a blessing. But ultimately, see, because here's the thing. God created the garden, and then God said, manage and steward what I've created. Men, you're going to have to be very careful about wanting to be creator and steward and manager. You're going to have to know your place. 
Because some of you, you're gonna be really successful and what it's gonna actually do is it's gonna well up pride in your heart. I've made this. I've created this. It's my smarts. It's, it's my wisdom. It's my work ethic that has made this and what the Lord is gonna have to remind you of and some of you might need even to be reminded of, of today is that you are simply called to be a manager and a steward of what God gives you. Because if you try to be this, if you try to be the owner, this is where Christians get it mixed up, right? Is we wanna be the owner instead of the manager. Nowhere in scripture does, does it say Christians own anything. We're a manager and steward of all things. But we see this in the created order, is that God made and put man in his place of being under God but over creation. Did you hear, did you hear that? As men, we're called to be under God, submitted to him, over creation, right? So he gave him, he gave him his image, he gave him value and worth, and then he gave him a job and partnership. Thirdly, he then gave them, he gave man boundaries. Men hate boundaries, right? Because what men are like is, I don't want no one telling me what to do. Amen. Men can be like, I don't want no one telling me what to do. I do what I want to do. And what you'll find, right, is men will want this, and they'll be like, I do what I want to do, right? And you see this many times with college students. They'll leave the house. They'll want freedom from the home. They'll go to college, and then they'll be completely bound by addiction. They'll be smoking stuff. They can't stop smoking, drinking stuff. They shouldn't be drinking, sleeping with people they shouldn't be sleeping with. So in their desire for freedom from boundaries, they've actually created more boundaries for themselves. This is why you have to be careful of saying, I don't want no one over me. I don't want to submit to any authority. Why? Because I'm my own God. Okay, well, if you are your own God, the weight of your life is on you. One of the blessings of submitting to God is that you can give him the weight of your life. But also, as you submit to him, what God in his love and what in his grace will give you are boundaries. Have you ever seen a kid with no boundaries? I got three boys. I call them the wear hurricane. They destroy they are destroyers. When they don't have boundaries, but y'all, many men, many people destroy their lives because they don't want bound, boundaries, thinking I'm gonna be free, but they actually become bound by the things they want freedom from, freedom to do. Every, every, is everyone okay? Happy Father's Day. Um, like I said, I wanna invite you into something better. Number four, after he gave him, a, after he gave him boundaries, he gave him a wife. So he said, I'm gonna give you worth, I'm gonna make you in my image, I'm gonna give you a job, I'm gonna give you boundaries, then I'm gonna give you a wife. To not say he gave him a side chick. He did not say I gave you a roommate. He didn't uh, say, hey, I, I gave you someone to have sex with. He said I gave you what? A wife. Oneness, he said, man shall leave his family, the woman shall leave his family, and they shall become how many flesh? One. one flesh. Shall become one flesh. And after he gave him a wife, he see, then he was like, hey, the, participate in what <laughs> happens after you get a wife. You be fruitful and multiply. That's sex and children. Now, I want you to take God's order here and equate it to our cultural moment. Because if this is a ladder of what we see, image from God, he has a job, he has boundaries, he has a wife, and then sex and children, doesn't it seem like in our culture, the ladder is turned upside down? I'm gonna say a few things. This is not shame, guilt, and condemnation. This is just, just called, I want us to feel the weight of the pressure we're in in our culture. What you're hearing is okay. What you're hearing is just like, it's normal. It's what the culture does, it's what we do. And this is not shame, guilt, cond condemnation. This is inviting you into something better. This is for some of you breaking generational curses. This is for some of you aligning you with truth. This is no whatever towards, any, this is just me sharing, right? And, so, because what you see is men will want sex before they want a wife.
they will not want to have a job. They'll want to find a woman that has a job so they can be taken care of. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying ladies shouldn't work. You shouldn't make money. This is not toxic masculinity. This is, this is not patriarchal hierarchy. This is not any of that stuff. This is, this is called ladies. Whenever you see, you see, see here's, here's the thing. Uh, first off, let me say this. I got a lot to say today. Ladies. This should be the kind of man you're looking for. Because ladies, what sometimes you'll do is you'll have a desire to be wanted and loved and you'll compromise this thinking you can change him. But the best thing you can do is not to look at what his, desi- or what his intentions are, look at the track record. Right? And listen, I understand there's same way circumstance. I, I like I, I understand all of this stuff, but this doesn't take away the standard. Okay. And sometimes, ladies, like what you'll do is you will see a man that needs to grow up, and you'll want to be his mother. Instead of saying, you know what, maybe. I need to entrust him to the Lord. Maybe if I do find him attractive and I see some qualities, I can encourage him to get into a church, get into a good men's ministry, get him around some good men, and let's see what happens, right? Like, I'm, because ladies, let me tell you this, the price you'll pay for getting into a relationship is, it's not worth feeling love and, like, not feeling wanted. Like, if, if, you know, and look, I know men in church can be hard to find. Unfortunately, the church can be a place where there's not a good crop to pick from. <laughs> but we're trying to change that at Lifehouse. We want to call the men higher. We want them to take responsibility. We want them to want to work, to be, lo- be accepting of boundaries, to say, I just don't want a girlfriend or a side chick. I, w- I want a wife. I want to put a ring on that thing. And I want to go in the right order where I don't go to a woman saying, fulfill my needs, and then you might be good enough to be my wife. Men, we got to do better. We got to do better. Do you see how, but do you see how this has all been shift, has all been shift, shift, has all been shifted? So when in Genesis 6, or when Jesus says like the days of Noah, do you see some resemblances? Because a lot of the things that were happening in Noah's day, it was a direct byproduct of this not being followed. And so this is where we find ourselves in the story of Noah, where it's like things were all out of order, divine order. It was just all whack, all crazy. And then you see in Genesis chapter 6, we, then we see the story of Noah. So what I want to share today is what I feel God calling our men to step into from the example of Noah. Ladies, you're going to be spoken to too, but I want to challenge the men here today in love and with, and with the heart. Now, I'm not sharing these from a place of pedestal. I'm sharing these from a place of things I'm wrestling with too. Trust me, before I preach, the Lord's got to beat me up a little bit. That's one of the hardest things about preaching is the Lord reveals things to you about your own life. And before I preach it, I have to deal with me. So starting in, verse, in chapter 6, verses 8 through 9, it says this, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. I want to pick out a couple things here. Number, number one, you see, Noah found favor with God. Here's the thing. Better men receive and walk in God's grace. I said this a couple weeks back, that when God graced Mary, the mother of Jesus, it it says that she found favor with God. That does not mean she was better than everyone else. It means that God specifically chose her and graced her for an assignment. So what we see here, Noah, is that when the Lord was looking for somebody to, for his plan to come through, it's not like Noah was better than everyone else. It says that Noah was favored In other words, graced by God for an assignment. And then it says that, then he says after he was graced, then he began to live righteously. Y'all, this is what the epitome of the gospel is. It's not do good and then you're graced. It's you're graced. And then from that grace, you walk out and live and do what God's called you to do. This is the gospel. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is not do more good things and then you become good. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the Lord because of what Jesus did on the cross makes you good. He gives you goodness. That's why it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. This is the what? Gift of God. And that is what we see in, in, in this story is that Noah was graced and then began to walk in righteousness. And y'all, some of you have been fed Gospels and even Paul references false gospels. He references like he went to a church that, that he planted in Galatia and he says, Who has bewitched you to believe a gospel differently than the gospel I preached to you? Because they were wanting to add to following Jesus laws and saying, Well, to be a Christian, you have to do this and this. You've got to accept Jesus and do this. And Paul was like, This is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Not Jesus plus good works or good works, and then good this. He's, no, it's the good news is that we have been graced. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, not yourself. It's a gift of God. And then because we've been graced, then we start to live and follow. Y'all, this is such good news because our culture will say do good, then you achieve. The gospel is you receive, and then you walk out and live up to who God has already said you are. Isn't this good news? And this is what God offers to us and offers to you and that we see in Noah's life is he was a man, here's the, here's the thing, better men are God-made, not self-made. Because what will happen in our culture is you will do, you will build, and then you'll think you're the builder. You will build, and then you think, I deserve this. When what, when what we see, Noah, is like Noah received grace and then walked in grace. Noah didn't create the grace and then walk in it, he Received it in his men, we have to be reminded that it's God that makes a man. And as much as we want to say that we're self-made, as much as we want to say we've built ourselves, pulled ourselves up from our own bootstraps, as men, there is a humility that comes with being a man of God that understands our place. Secondly, we see here from the few verses here that better men walk faithfully with God. It was said about Noah that he was graced, he was favored, he walked or, or he was a preacher of righteousness, but then it says he walked faithfully with God. Better men walk faithfully with God. Do you know, men, God doesn't want you perfect. God wants you faithful. So many men carry the weight of perfection on their life. And I even believe today the Lord is gonna break some of you of perfectionism that is keeping you from stepping in to the love of the Father. Maybe because you had a dad, you messed anything up, it was condemnation. You messed anything up. You're an idiot. Why are you so stupid? And what has you've, you've sub, sub, subconsciously done is you've equated God's voice with your earthly father's voice. And what I believe that the Lord wants to do today is he wants to release you from that. To where you're able to decipher what your earthly father's voice is and what your heavenly father's voice is. Walking faithfully with God means you're not perfect, you're faithful, and it's simply like that you are on a journey with him. Right? That's why Jesus called himself the way. What do you do with the path? You do what? You walk it, right? And when it comes to your walk with Jesus, that is what you're ultimately called to do is to walk with God faithfully. How many of you, you got kids and you take walks? One of the favorite things I do as a dad is to go on walks with my boys. Normally, they turn into me making sure they don't get hit by cars. Normally, it makes, you know, turns into me not wanting them to fight each other. But what I love the most, it gives me a lot of peace, is when I hold their hands and we're just walking. And they almost get close to me because they feel protected. They feel wanted. They feel valued. They feel seen. Like, I can feel these things coming from them. And y'all, I just, I, I just really believe that ultimately that as we follow Jesus, this is what our walk with God looks like, is that we walk faithfully with him. And it's a long journey. It's got ups and downs and peaks and valleys. And as we're walking, there are things that I have to protect my kids from. That I have to tell them, hey, watch out for, for that. But ultimately, your walk with God is a walk. And all he asks of you is to be faithful. So when you go off, come back. If you're confused, get clarity, right? What we see better men, what we see Noah doing and modeling for us is he was graced. He, be, he walked in righteousness and he walked faithfully.
with God. Let's, let's go to Genesis 6. This is what it says here. It says, now the earth was corrupt. So this is where we kind of see them laying out vision here. It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark. And that word make yourself could also be build. Everyone say build. Build yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. You see that, it's this, that it said that Noah walked faithfully with God. And as Noah was walking faithfully with God, God started to lay out a plan and vision for what was going to happen. Let me say this. When you walk with God, you'll have vision. There are some men here. You feel so cloudy about where to go and what to do and how to do it. And what I want to encourage you to believe today is that as you start to walk faithfully with God, the Lord will give you vision. Because what we see here, Noah, he walks faithfully with God, and God lays out for him what's going to happen to the earth. And what I believe is that men need vision. Men need vision. Scripture says this, without vision, people what? Perish. I got three boys. When they don't have vision, I perish. When I don't have vision for, for, for the family, my family perishes. And many times it's not that we don't have vision, it's just that we have the wrong vision. Because you have a vision that's wanting to be created for you by culture of what success looks like. Get this job, with this retirement, with this boat, with this house. And that is what the vision normally looks like. But what we see when you start to faithfully walk with God, the vision for what success looks like, less about what you have and more about the kind of person you are becoming. And men, we will always have a proclivity to want to get more, be more, and do more than focus on being more. And we will sacrifice being and who we are becoming to get more and more. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Men will have a proclivity towards sacrificing their character to get more stuff. And we will relegate character development and we'll relegate Christ likeness and we'll relegate these things that ultimately matter that Jesus wants to invite us into vision wise. We will relegate that so we can get more stuff, be, be, have a better status, be more. Do y'all see what I'm saying? And what, I, what, I, what you'll actually find is that as you walk faithfully with the Lord, what is important will actually bubble up. And you'll actually see what matters to God more than anything isn't what you have, it's who you are. It's who you are becoming. And some of you men, you have felt the pain of this. You have felt the pain of, of neglecting your character development at the expense of wanting more with a heart to provide. And what you found is that when you got to a place of having more, your character couldn't handle what you had. And what you'll actually find is God in his grace will make the house you've built fall to see how unstable the foundation was so you can see and rebuild the foundation. That's why Jesus says there, he gave the parable of the two builders. One built their house on sand, one on rock. He said one, when they built their house on rock, when the wind and waves came, it was swayed, but it stayed because it was firm foundation. But then the one that built it on sand, when the winds and the waves came, it washed away because its foundation wasn't solid. What I want to say, men, is sometimes God in his grace will show you the weakness of what you've built so you can rebuild on a firm foundation. But that's what we also see here, right? Is you see Noah, God said, here's the vision, here's what's going to happen. And then he said, Noah, I want you to build. Everyone say build. Build. Here's, here's the thing, better men are builders. Better men have a building mindset. Meaning, you realize your call as a man given by God, your responsibility to not be a destroyer, but to be a builder. I don't know if you've seen this, but men are either going to build or destroy. Right? And what I see God inviting us into, and just let me give you a few thoughts on this. 
God invites us into building better men build is this. Better men build with priorities in mind. Priorities. Because men, if men don't have priorities, they'll build whatever makes them feel good, not what matters for eternity. So what do those things look like? Your priorities for most men is your relationship with God. You build a relationship with God. You build a marriage with your wife. You build relationship with and help build character into your children. And then you build at your job. Y'all, men, can I just tell you, these, the, for most of your life, these are gonna be your four priorities. If you try to fit anything else in there, can you? Yes, but it's, see, but what ends up happening is, is when this order gets messed up, like some of you, you'll put your children above your wife. You see what I'm saying? Some of you will put your vocation above your relationship with God. Some of you will put your hobbies above your vocation. Everyone, everyone don't okay, you guys are quiet today, so I don't I don't know how I don't I, I don't know how to read y'all. Okay, good. All right, all right, all right. Um, and when when men don't build with these God-given priorities in mind, is we will get all out of whack. Because ultimately, God's called you to build your relationship with him first. And as you build your relationship with him, that gives you the fuel to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. And then that will enable you to multiply yourself in your children. So you're not just available to your children. You're being intentional and helping them become like Jesus. And then as you build your relationship with God, then that will be the fuel to go to your job. And, not, and yes, you have bosses, but to realize God's the ultimate boss. I'm just not here for a paycheck. I'm here for an eternal purpose. And what, what I have found and what I, I believe today to, to encourage you with is Jesus in Scripture is called the chief cornerstone of the church, meaning the foundation of the church is Jesus. Meaning, guess what you get to do being the foundation? You know what the foundation does? How many of y'all, like, glamour at the foundation of houses. It's like, ooh, look at here. Look at that foundation. Isn't she pretty? No, many times being the foundation is anything but glorious. Many times people don't go and celebrate a foundation. Many people don't go and be like, I want to be a foundation. But guess what bears all the weight? The foundation. And what I felt the Lord um, encouraging me to tell the men in this place is that as Jesus was called to be the cornerstone of the church, you're called to be the cornerstone of the family. You're called to be the foundation of the family. Yes, with Jesus as your foundation. But ultimately, when Jesus created the man first, it wasn't because the man was better he was saying, man, you will have the responsibility. When Adam, when Eve sinned, who did God call for? Adam, where are you? Why? Because he was ultimately what? Responsible. Men, let me just throw some weight on you in love. You are responsible. In the same way, Jesus, it says in Ephesians 5, men love your wives as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself up for it. That is what ultimately being the foundation looks like. So men, as you are called to be the foundation of your family, that will inevitably mean you are going to feel a junk load of weight. Amen? Men, do you feel it? God and children and wife and vocation. And what I feel like the Lord wants to encourage you with today is know if you feel the weight, you're right where you need to be. Yeah, come on. Let's give it up for the men in our lives who bear that weight. If you feel the weight, that's the blessing that God wants you to have because you're created to bear weight. 
And this is why it's so vital. If your vision is on anybody but Jesus, the one who bared the weight who didn't have to, the one who bared the weight of the church, the one who bared the weight of your sin, the one who bared the weight of your rebellion, the one who bared the weight, if you're not locked in on him as your example for what a man should be, if your vision gets anywhere else when you feel the weight, you'll jet and run. And here's what you'll do. You'll start to blame. You'll start to complain. And listen, I'm not saying you might need places to be able to share and process. But at the same, same time, if, if you are not locked in on Jesus as the example of what a man is that leads his family, that leads his wife, that leads his children, then when the weight gets to be heavy, you will run and blame and get away from the weight that God's called you to bear. And you'll think you're going to something better when actually what you're doing is, is you're running from the responsibility and gift that God's given you as a man. Are you all hearing me today? Men, the Lord is inviting you to bear weight. It's sad in our culture that we see men running from responsibility like it's the plague. Ah, marriage? No, I'm going to get married when I'm 40, maybe. But I'm going to have a bunch of girlfriends and do what I want to do until, and then once I settle down, then I'll get right. No, you won't. You developed a pattern. You can by God's grace, but it's going to be hard. Kids? <laughs> Following God with boundaries? No. Do you all see what I'm saying? Men, the Lord has called you to bear weight. And if there, is any, if there are things wrong, what we don't do as men is blame. We say, where do we need to die more? Jesus, when we mess up, when you mess up, he doesn't look at the church and say, you need to get better. No, Jesus says, I died for this. This is very encouraging on Father's Day, isn't it? <laughs> but what I'm hoping you hear today, men, is God's called you to something better. I didn't say easier, I said better. Ladies, as you're evaluating what, if you're single, what you need to be looking for, you need to look for a man that can bear some weight. And doesn't look at responsibility as a plague. <laughs> but is ready to say, I'm ready to step into what God has gifted and called me to do. Men, you can't bear the weight alone. This is why so many men just, just want to give up. It's because you're literally trying to bear the weight by yourself. No one knows you're suffering in silence. Man, can I just invite you to, to like, the, you, you, here's what I'm saying. Your power will come from your, vul, from your vulnerability, not your willpower. One of the best places to grow, to, to bear this weight is with your church family. That's why I want to invite you out every Tuesday night at 630 Men from our church gathered together. We serve dinner. We build relationship. We study the Bible. We get in small groups. We pray, and it becomes a place for you to bear the weight, not on your own, but in a group of men that can say, you're struggling here, me too. Let's hold each other accountable. All right, men, don't suffer in silence. You don't have to. Ladies, kick your man out the house on Tuesday nights. Be like, get to, get to Velocity Church. I just want to believe some of you need to hear that today. Don't suffer alone. Bear the weight alone because it, it is a weight, y'all. But it's a God-given one that he wants you to see with joy because it's what you were made to bear. As Jesus did. Okay, number second thought. Better men build with legacy in mind. Men, let me tell you this, or let me just say this. Like Many men are more concerned with having a good time than leaving a great legacy. You see what I'm saying? Many men will mess around for years and then want to settle down. Can I just tell you, men, listen. What do you want said about you at your funeral? What do you want your kids to say? What do you want your wife to say? 
you should think about the top three things you want said about you at your funeral and let those be your priorities with them. One of the things is I want my kids to say they help me know God. You know what I hope my kids say at me when, I'm, when they're at my funeral? My dad prayed for me every night. My, my dad taught me the Bible. My dad took me to church and helped me build a firm foundation that when the craziness of life happened, I was secure. I want them to know that I wasn't just available, I was intentional. There's a difference between being present and intentional. Dads, we can be present. Being present is important. That's a huge gift. But be intentional. Legacy mindset. Because here's the thing. You're going to leave a legacy. What kind will you leave? Some of you are struggling right now because of the legacy you were handed. You know what I'm saying? And what I believe the Lord is inviting our men to do is to give legacy of blessings, not burden. Is to think, do I want the cycle to continue with me or do I want it to stop with me? And the Lord is calling some of you to be cycle breakers. Where the cycle of insanity, the cycle of alcoholism, the cycle of absentee father, the cycle of not getting married or kids out of wedlock, the cycle of all of these things that have been generational things in your family with you, it's going to be like, not this generation. Number three, better men are okay with being thought of as crazy. Who's that? My man Christian. And what I mean by crazy, y'all, people were probably thought Noah was an idiot. This dude building an ark? For rain? What the heck is rain? That's dumb. But what did he have? He had vision. He had a call from God. So he was like, I'm going to build it. And even one of the things that said about Noah, he was a preacher of righteousness. So he was probably, probably, probably like letting people know, hey, guys, let's let them know I'm building this boat because one day it's going to rain. And, you know, and they're like, ha, 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 whatever, you know. But just know, men, as, as you build God's way, you'll be thought of as crazy. When you prioritize your relationship with God, as you prioritize the things of God, as you prioritize your family attending church, reading the Bible together, like when you prioritize these things, you'll, you'll actually see that men might publicly abuse you but secretly admire you. And when crap hits the fan in their life, guess where they're going to head? To the one that's got a firm foundation. Fourthly, better men encourage other men to build what matters. Like I said, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He probably said, hey, come on. Like, I, I, like I'm, you know, I'm building this boat. You should come and help me build. Well, I've never built it before. You know, like, and, and men, other men around you need to hear encouragement. Can I just talk to you about how important encouragement is to men? Ladies, can I just tell you how important encouragement is to your man? There's such power in encouragement. Because men, like I said, inevitably, we are always looking at what we're not and what we're not doing. And when we hear our, our spouse look at us and say, babe, I see what you're doing. I, I see you're trying. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for men. Doesn't that make a difference? Got someone that agrees. There's something powerful that happens, ladies, when you see your man and you don't just in your mind say, oh, that's cool. You verbalize it and say, babe, thank you for, thank you for, thank you for. There's power in that. And I know for some of you, like, like and, and this one, I say, if you want to see any man change. So, ladies, you might have a man and, you know, he needs some work, some areas. It bothered you a long time. Can I just encourage you, nagging won't change anything. And I say that with love. You need to see your husband the way that God sees us. God doesn't nag us. You might think it's nagging, but actually the Holy Spirit just reminds us. And, but one of the best ways is to actually encourage your husband to, to change is, is to actually find something he's doing that, that is good. Might only be one thing. Babe, I love the way you cut the grass. <laughs> Do I see this line on the grass when you weed eat? Man, that looked good. You know, like, and just encourage him. 
But then ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, how can I invite my husband? Like how, because some of you are like, here's the thing, right? Ladies, you won't bring change to your husband with, without the Holy Spirit. You're trying to do, do it yourself. Invite the Holy Spirit in and say, what should I say? How should I say it? When should I say it? And invite the Holy Spirit in. Okay, I got to end. Christian, please, please come up. All right. In closing, better men. No, oh, excuse me. What we realize from Noah's life is better men know it's never too late to start building. So for context, Noah was 500 years old when he started building. Now some of you are like, John, what the heck? Well, this was back in the day. So like, you know, in that time, people were living to be 1,000 years old. And, and um, what we actually see is God couldn't stand people for 1,000 years. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why he said in Genesis chapter 6, he's like, my spirit can't contend with man for 1,000. They're going to be cut to 120. But what we actually see is Noah here. So it says Noah lived to be about 900 something. And so Noah actually started to build and do God's will like at the halftime of his life. And I just found that really encouraging because some of you here, men, your first half has been insanity and crazy and not been the best building whatsoever. And because of that, you can think you're disqualified, like things will never get, get better. I, I, I have done too much wrong. But what I wanna encourage you here today with is it's never too late to make a decision to start building God's way. Never too late. Is it gonna be difficult? You're absolutely right. But at the same time, the Lord is inviting you in today, men, to start building his way with his priorities, with legacy in mind, with his vision so you can have a satisfied joy and the King of Kings can get glory. And this is what the Lord is inviting us into today. It's inviting some of you men that you are surrounded by shame and guilt and condemnation. And the Lord is saying, listen, yes, let's deal with your past. Jesus is like, I dealt with your past. I died on the cross for it. Let's step into the good news. Let me grace you, give you the ability to live righteously and to build a life that honors me, blesses women, blesses children, blesses communities, blesses the church and the mission of God. Isn't this good news? What the Lord invites us into. This is our heart for men at Lifehouse. Ladies, this is what I pray you'll be praying over your man. Give him vision. Help him walk with God faithfully. Help him be a builder. And then come alongside him. Right, one of the things scripture says, it wasn't good for man to be alone. Yo, I've been living this single life for nine days. Kristen's mom, she just had surgery. I've been single for nine days. It ain't good for man to be alone, bruh. But sometimes men can feel alone. And, and, and so, I just want to encourage ladies, encourage you men. Honor them today. All right. Can everyone stand? Really what I felt led to do today. In closing, we're going to do communion.